Hey there, and welcome to another Change Catalyst conversation where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with building cohesive, vision-driven teams that make sustainable change happen, even when change seems impossible. I'm Casey Watts, Impact Coaching Consultant and the host of this show. What I know from experience is that making change happen can be overwhelming and downright hard. Sometimes as an instructional leader, you survey your organization from a bird's eye view, and it can seem as though you're witnessing an anthill that's been knocked down and ants are scattering everywhere. No one has a collective understanding of why change should happen or what change to begin first. You notice false starts again and again because a solid action plan hasn't been crafted or you're met with resistance because you don't know how to motivate such complex people. The thing about ants though, is that they have one common goal and that is to collectively rebuild one solid anthill. But this doesn't always happen for schools. You see, we can say as much as we want that tier one instruction needs to happen or that a curriculum needs to be implemented with fidelity or that PLCs need to be collaborative and support student learning. But these broad ambiguous goals do nothing to help teachers and staff build capacity and actually make change happen. And that leads to schools remaining in a cycle of stagnancy experiencing the same problems and ineffectively repeating the same initiatives again and again. This leads to low morale, burnout, high turnover, and it leaves our students to suffer most. But if instructional leaders can get really clear on a narrowed instructional focus and script the critical moves for people, then we can make collective efficacy a united colony of educators, if you will, possible. My goal is to make cohesive, vision-driven school teams a possibility. I help school leaders zoom out to cast vision and then zoom back in to script critical moves that help teams collectively go farther, faster, and better, even when change seems impossible. One way I do this is by coaching leaders through the Clarity Cycle Framework, a cycle for building sustainable capacity through intentional clarity processes. Are you ready to feel great about exactly where you and your campus are headed? And are you ready to know exactly how you're going to get there? If so, you're going to want to stop right now and head to catchingupwithkc.com to learn more about the Clarity Cycle Framework and then come back to catch up on this episode. It'll still be here when you get back. Okay, now that you are primed for thinking about cohesive vision-driven teams that make change happen, let's jump into this week's Change Catalyst conversation. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another live Change Catalyst conversation. I am stoked to be here tonight with some very special friends of mine, and in a moment, they're going to introduce themselves. But I want to tell you first two things. Number one, tonight's live is all about the lost art of lesson design, and it has been a very hot topic in my circle of people Again and again and again, I feel like it never stops coming up. So we know that there's got to be some meaty conversation behind this, and we're going to have it tonight. The second thing is that at the end of tonight's show, I'm going to be sharing the person who won the one spot that I was giving away for the Clarity Cycle Mastermind. I know, I'm so excited. Um <laughs> And that is happening in June. So if you want to know more about the Clarity Cycle Mastermind, go to um, bit.ly slash Clarity Cycle. You'll learn all about it. And I've got some additional YouTube videos from previous conversations where I share all about that. Okay, I'm ready to jump into our conversation. And tonight, what we're going to do, because there are four of us here, and we know it can take a little bit of time to like tell about who we are, where we're from, and what we do, We're kind of keeping it brief there, but I'm going to be putting in the show notes the locations of each of these ladies, so we're going to have lots of links for you to go to, lots of great resources. So this is kind of like a double duty episode, I feel like, because you're getting some content here, and then when you finish, you're going to go to the show notes, and you're just going to like 
spend some time drinking your wine, drinking your coffee and your dinner and seeing like, ooh, what is it that they have to offer? And you're going to go through all of it. It's kind of like you're scrolling through social media, but it's actually really valuable stuff. So we're going to start by sharing who we are, what we do, and then maybe like one thing you plan to do for Memorial Day tomorrow. If you're even celebrating, you may you may be like, I don't have any plans at all. So, Jonna, let's start with you. Tell us tell us your sure. who you are and all of that stuff. Yes. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me on, Casey. Um, my name is Jonna Lee. I live in New Jersey. I am an education consultant. I help uh, teachers, superintendents, and principals meet their goals and the needs of their students. Um, and a Memorial Day plan, we are, I've got three little ones, and um, my husband and I and my parents are going to go to the parade in town tomorrow morning. Oh, so, fine. Fine. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Michelle? Hi, so I am Michelle Rui. I am instructional coach K-5 in a small but growing town in South Carolina. So I'm still in the, in the schools every day working alongside teachers. And I have just started a little um, side business, I guess you could say, where I share content and tips and ideas for other educators out there. And one day hope to work alongside them as a consultant myself. Um, Let's see. One thing from Memorial Day. Actually, we had a graduation party on what day is it? Sunday. We had a graduation <laughs> party on Friday, yesterday and I was out of town today. So I am just sleeping and cleaning tomorrow. <laughs> that sounds nice, actually. Yeah. So good. Cleaning for. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Alyssa. Yeah. My name is Alyssa Crabtree and I am an instructional leadership coach and consultant. And I am in the Houston, Texas area. And I'm with Michelle. Tomorrow I am cleaning, but I'm also sleeping in and probably going to stuff my face a little bit. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, I love I love every bit of that, of course, except the cleaning. But I, too, probably I will find myself inevitably cleaning the house. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, you guys already know me because I introduced myself at the beginning of the, the mm -hmm. video in the introduction. But my Memorial Day plans are to I have a workout group tomorrow morning, which never happens because I'm working during the day. And then I have plans with all of my friends tomorrow night for a big like cookout. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and we'll be taking care of our baby raccoon. So if you, <laughs> if you haven't seen oh, yeah. baby raccoon, you can go and take a look at last week's episode because there's like a full on like little episode that happens at the beginning of the show with little baby Roxy raccoon. Okay. <laughs> And I'm hoping, like, I just fed her, so tonight she should be pretty chill and not squealing. So let's talk about our topic. We were thinking about the lost art of lesson design. And I know for a fact that that stings a little bit when you say it to certain people, specifically mm -hmm. teachers. So I really want to dig in and think about... First of all, what do we mean when we use the phrase lesson design? And is that synonymous with building lesson plans? What are your thoughts, ladies? I'll hop in. I gave this one some thought ahead of time. Um, you know, when I think of lesson design, I think of a framework. I think of what is the um, what are the parameters of my lesson? What are some of what I call the non-negotiables that have to be part of my lesson uh, or even yeah, the, the nitty gritty, what's happening on a daily basis. Um, and then when I think of lesson plan, it's filling in that information on the regular. And that comes from um, your students' uh, learning needs, their diverse profiles, um, your formative assessments, um, you know, your own expertise as a teacher. You know your students the best. You are the ones with them probably more than, than they are with their own parents in some ways, um, or, or, you know, caretakers. So um, there, is a, there is a difference for, for me in terms of what do we mean by design and what do we mean by, by plan. And, and you need to have both of those in order to, I think, alleviate a lot of the pressures and the hardships that come with um, that come with teaching. And perhaps that means front loading in the beginning and figuring out what does my design look like? And then how will I input that information once my year 
um, my year starts. Mm -hmm. And John, I want to piggyback off of that because I feel like so often teachers and administrators, everyone involved in lesson, even curriculum writers, they just jump straight into the planning without having that collaborative conversation of what truly impacts student learning. And I will venture to say, if your lesson design looks the same way it did five years ago, it's probably not impactful. And so having that conversation every year before you go in and plug and play for your plans, you have to determine how are students learning so that we can specifically design lessons that reach them and help them be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would add, I think that a lot of teachers think that the plans are the list of things that you do, the what, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the design really is the why, the why in relation to your students. And that I feel like is the design part that often gets missed. Yeah. 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 And we have, I've always heard people talk about like your love lessons, the lessons that you love that you do again and again and again and again, Mm -hmm. year after year after year. But some of those things, when we pull them out of our pocket, because they're lessons that we love, but lessons that we're comfortable with, like you said, Alyssa, like we're not necessarily teaching the students in that moment. We're teaching the lesson. We're Mm -hmm. teaching the, the stuff and we're not teaching the lessons. And that's, that is one area where I'm like, oh man, there, that part of it. And I feel like, I feel like, and I, I'm, you guys may, may think differently, but just in being in education for so long, you can see how things have shifted over time. And whereas I feel like maybe ten, I'm going to say 10 years ago, 10 ish mm-hmm. years ago, Lesson design was a big deal. Like you were crafting your lessons and it truly is an art and you practice it and you get better at it. But over time, I feel like we've shifted to this time period where people don't even know exactly what lessons, like what lesson planning looks like, what lesson design looks like and feels like and sounds like with their teams. And we're left going out to our built curriculum that has every single thing you could possibly imagine. So how would anyone ever effectively teach that boxed curriculum of of junk? I'm going to say it. And, and, or they're going to teachers pay teachers, which I'm going to say right now, I'm not necessarily not a fan of teachers pay teachers, but we go to it without considering our students, without considering like, how does this fit into the actual lesson? How does it fit with the standards? How does it fit with what we want students to be able to know, say, and do, you know? Yeah. You know, I would venture to say probably, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, we talked about the attention span being the same age as a child. And, you know, if you're 10, you have 10 minutes to capture their attention. Well, I would venture to say now, like you have three minutes, mm-hmm. yeah, three minutes to, to get that. And so what are some ways, you know, you have in ELA, you have connect, teach, uh, uh, connect, teach, active, engage, and link. Am I missing something? I feel like I'm missing something. That's right. Yes. And then (laughs) with science, you have like the five E's and, you know, it's the engage, explore, uh, explain, elaborate. I can't remember all of them, but you have those elements and it's like, okay, where can we, and I feel like the five E's kind of fits a little more of that inquiry based to where students naturally go down these rabbit holes, but we have to create those experiences for them through purposeful design. Those activities that are in those curriculum containers are are kind of problematic now Mm -hmm. because it's an easy, not an easy, I mean, it took time to create those, but it's just, hey, let's go get it without, like Casey said, thinking of what's best for our students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's in everything. That's in like the the books that you're reading with kids in small group. It comes, it always comes with like, here's a plethora of things you could try. And that gets overwhelming to even like sift through. So you kind of just do all kinds of things. And, you know, just so much of this is like handed to teachers and it almost takes them more time to go through it and curate it than um, it does just to run through it as is. Yeah. I think one way that you can, I don't want to say a workaround, but when you're feeling that sense of being overwhelmed and that sense of, you know, feeling like you have so much 
so many different directions that the lesson could go in or the content or skill could go in. Uh, one thing that I tend to tell teachers is ask yourself, what is it that you want your students at the end of this lesson? What is the goal? Honey, mommy's in a meeting right now, okay? <laughs> okay, okay, go. Honey, go. Um, what is the, you know, <laughs> it never has. I could, have, I could have 15 <laughs> locked doors and yeah. be in a maze and my kids would still find me. Uh -huh. um, but what is it that you want your students to be able to do at the end of the lesson? And keeping it you know, as succinct and as realistic as possible. And I think this is where we kind of, as educators, go back to the basics of being our authentic creative selves in terms of taking the curriculum that is built and prepackaged and given to us and turning it into our own. And I'll be honest, I was given curriculum and sometimes I just didn't use it because mm -hmm. I found that yeah. as was not, it was not useful because mm -hmm. I spent more time trying to sift through something that was given to me rather than just using my own expertise yeah. and trust. Right. Um, and I think that that's a great place to start. Like what, where do I want my students to be at the end of this lesson? What is a realistic approach and or a realistic goal and then working backwards. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me consider, I've got 45 minutes in front of me. This is where we are in the content and just kind of not overthinking it and yeah. just, you know, using your knowledge to, um, to figure out the best way to get your students to that end goal. Yeah. And you know, Jonna, I even take it to, <clears throat> they say that, you know, you ask a teacher that, what do you want at the end of this 45 minute lesson? And oftentimes a teacher will tell you the mastery of the standard. And, and I just want to say your child will not master the standard in one day, unless they have had the privilege to have experience with their standard prior. Other than that, you have to look at the progression for learning. And that's where a lot of people misstep. They, they don't look at the progression what are all the things you need to be able to do before you can get here? And I would even take it as far to say, if you were to ask one teacher on a team what they want at the end of a lesson, it would be different than maybe what their counterpart said. And so where is that collaborative conversation mm -hmm. going? You know, I've, I think it, part of it too, it's sort of been taken from them because any curriculum that I can think of it tells you like the objective, like it's like, yeah. that's the where you want kids, they're supposed to go, right? And so, and a lot of times too, teachers are told just follow it with fidelity. It's, it's follow it, it's gonna, it's gonna get you there, right? So they have this sense of like, all right, I'll trust it. This is what it says that my kids will know and be able to do. So they trust it Yeah. and that's not how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. so. I feel like this is where we've lost the art. Like the, the art has been lost in that we're not, we're no longer thinking about what is our end goal and how do we plan from there. And we're no longer thinking about what is my end goal based on my individual students' needs and where they have been and where they're going, et cetera. Yep. We have lost that art. And I want to, I want to carry this conversation into what is really, um, it's not hot. It's uh, debatable. Like, and it is debated a lot. And that is lesson plans mm -hmm. because here's what happens. And I have experience with, this is what I am most familiar with. And I totally get it from both sides. I understand both perspectives, but when you have teams, because that's what this show is all about. Cohesive vision driven teams. Well, teams of teachers generally will get together for lesson planning, right? Like they have a planning period. They get together, they, they do lesson planning. That lesson planning, it sounds like this. Okay, what are we going to put on the lesson plans? What are we going yes. to do? Yep. What is the activity that we're going to do? What is the product that they're going to do? It is just like, okay, we're plugging, plugging, plugging. We're going to gather all of the stuff that goes with it. And there is little to no conversation about what that's actually going to look like in the classroom. So when you go back to the classroom, you have teachers who either are highly experienced or just naturally have that art of lesson design. And they go back and they kick ass in their classrooms. You know, like they're rocking and rolling. They have the perspective that everyone else is doing the same thing because that's what they're doing. You know, that's their natural tendency. But then you have teachers who go back and they're like, 
what's crap? I don't know. I'm maybe I'm going to pull this curriculum or maybe I'm just going to um, have the kids do this or they hear the, um, oh, you know, the I do, we do, you do. Okay. And I get that, but that is so ambiguous to someone who doesn't mm -hmm. have an understanding of true lesson design. So let me pull up this comment and we can talk about this. I see how teacher candidates, I know exactly who this person is, and I'm assuming Alyssa Landry know that this is you. I see how teacher candidates in higher ed struggle with lesson planning. One interesting quote, why are we planning lessons? My school will give me this once I get hired. Yeah. And that's what's happening more and more, especially in literacy lately, where yeah. It's like a, this hamster wheel that we're never going to get off of because people keep being given and handed, do this this way or you're not right. But then we want them, we encourage them to, to think through and develop design lessons to match their kids, but we don't let them. Right. <laughs> it's kind of like, I don't know, like I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this carrot. Okay. Keep, yeah. keep coming along. I'm going to give it to you in a little bit, in a little bit. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it started with the best of intentions. Let's take some stuff off of teachers' plates because they're so overwhelmed. We know that our teachers are the hardest working people in the, I'm going to say the world. Like I, would, teachers, I would say that. <laughs> yes. And they ha are having to make 20 million decisions a day. Yep. So it really goes to, oh, let's take something off their plate. Unfortunately, the wrong thing is being taken off the plate. Yep. And lesson planning, what I have found is with this curriculum that was built with the best of intentions, it has taken away the art of creating and mm -hmm. the art of backwards design and the art of making decisions based on what is right for your students. Yeah. And so that is very I don't know. It's sad. It's, it you sad. know, as a, mm -hmm. as a teacher, I always felt like I was an artist. I'm an artist and I get to create and I get, and I will own, I will own, especially when I was a district coach, I pushed the curriculum and I believed in that curriculum. And I was like, this is it people. If you do it with fidelity, I was that person. And, and were there moments where I still will stand by what we did? Absolutely. However, it's not the end all be all. And we have to allow teachers the freedom to create, but also give them the tools on how to create. Right. I, I think that responsibility here, we're, we're so the conversation naturally is taking a teacher centric approach. But ultimately, I place the same amount, if not more, responsibility on leadership roles, principal, mm -hmm. assistant principal, to ensure that there is consistent messaging, that there are resources for teachers, and that teachers in their PLCs have time to align what the planning process looks like. Um, no two plans have to look the same, but my God, it's going to be so much easier for teachers to create a plan if it's consistent across grades, if it's a school-wide yeah. initiative, and if their principal backs it. Yeah. I don't blame the teacher who isn't given common planning time or whose agenda is preset for them at the beginning of the year in terms of what every PLC meeting will be. Mm -hmm. I don't blame that teacher who's kind of like, well, what, what do you want me to do right? Like, how am I supposed to do this? Right. It requires as lead learners, it requires the principal to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. and part of the um, experience in what lesson planning looks like. It's the principals. I find it, it's almost, if the principals are the ones that are going into the classrooms and giving these observations, they damn well also better be part of that planning design. Yeah. And, you know, working with teachers. Um, and ter in terms of carving out the time and being part of those conversations, this is not just a teacher problem. Um, and, and there needs to be responsibility there. I need and that I on a shirt, Jonna. Like, I need, I need oh, yeah. that. Yeah. Do you know how many times, but honestly, how many times I go into schools and the difference when a principal comes with me to visit classrooms, uh -huh. it says, well, the sign up sheet, the sign in sheet is over there, right? Your name, the date, the time you arrived, here's your schedule and go. Yeah. You know, 
the the comment that was made the who said that how are we that the if a student teacher says why are we planning lessons my school will give me once i get hired on i think my response to that would be in a nutshell collective efficacy and if you want to strengthen if collective efficacy is the number one impact or it's number two now number two impact of student learning period if we want to strengthen that teams have to create together and they have to design together and they have to to be able to backwards plan together that's going to strengthen it so if if i just take a curriculum and run with it i'm going to have a completely different interpretation than michelle might have or casey might have we have to come to that together so my response to that teacher would be you can take that curriculum but to amplify its impact, create, audit it together, dive into it together. That togetherness is important. So yeah. this then begs the question, do we have lots of administrators who are skilled in facilitating the conversation to push teachers to get at the why? Do we? Yeah. I, I feel what? there are some, there's not enough. Mm-hmm. And we have administrators that, again, have 20 million competing priorities, but instructional leadership should trump di be discipline because guess what? Your discipline is going to decrease when students are engaged in learning and feeling success. Mm -hmm. And so we have to strengthen the work of our administrators. Yeah. 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 There was a um, comment earlier Someone said, um, many are not even doing that. How do I get them to see the value? And I think that a large part of lesson planning, it's sort of been um, weaponized in a weird way, right? It's like this has this just like negative, bitter taste when we think about lesson planning. But to be honest, lesson planning is what I think the game changer for creating more time, energy, and resources for yourself. Yes. Um, think about all of the demands of teaching, data collection, um, IEP goals, um, needing to you know measure your objectives and those progress reports. If you have within your plan how you're doing those things, then when it comes time to have to submit or you know uh, upload or uh, talk about it with your PLCs. It's in a place that's um, easy for you to access. Everything's been sort of a, 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 um, outlined and it's in one sort of um, compartment where yeah. now they have, because there was a plan, we know that there was action behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easier for teachers to, in the end, have that rather than be scrambling as I'm sure many teachers at the end of the year right now are. Yeah. Here's another like wrench in things though. I feel like all the technology that we rely on now, not just teachers pay teachers, but how many schools out there really rely on iReady or mm -hmm. IXL or like all of those, they just kind of put kids on them and they're sort of self-led and then you'll get these reports spit out, but do you know what they mean? Yeah. You know, or, or do you have time to figure out what they mean? So, so many places we're taking away that um, autonomy and that ownership from teachers yeah. because of the technology. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Michelle, we have right now in Texas, and I don't know everywhere else, but House Bill 1605 right now, and it is the approval of a state mandated curriculum that is all online. Yep. All online. And the more that we get pushback on lesson plans, the more fuel they have to push that bill through. And it it is terrifying because if that passes, autonomy is gone. Your public mm -hmm. funding is going straight to that Amplify program or like you said, IXL or whatever. Your, your funding is going there. And your creativity is taken away. Yeah. So like my, again, going back to being an artist, teachers are artists. Mm -hmm. Don't take away my paintbrush. Don't take away my paint palette. Yeah. It, it's, it's scary. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And when we do that, like if, when we fall into that one and done program or whatever it is, then we are assuming that 
all children are the same. Like we are teaching one average child. And why are they coming to school? Right. Yeah. What is the point? Mm -hmm. Yep. Think, think about like when an architect, think about a chef, think about any other profession. When you, in, in many professions, you have to submit a plan. I'm not going to have an architect work on my house unless I see the plan that the architect has developed. Yeah. I'm not going to have a chef cook a, you know, five-star meal for me unless I know exactly what it is that he's cooking. She yeah. is cooking, I should say. <laughs> Um, You know, I mean, it's just kind of like, it's just part of the job. It's just part of the job. And at what point do administrators need to lay some sort of, you know, line down in the sand and say, you're either on this side or you're on that side? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, it goes to clarity. Like we have to clarify the purpose instead of making it a compliance issue. That you're going to, and I will tell you, I have seen some lesson plan templates that are outrageous and I would be kind of furious too, Um, but there needs to be a cohesive understanding of why we lesson plan and let's collaborate on lesson design every single year. Let's reflect on student learning this past year. What changes would you make? Man, you know what? I lost my kids after three minutes. Well, guess what? Your teaching point, and maybe you do a teaching point, explore, model, explore. Like, like let's revamp our lesson design each year. But like Michelle pointed out, administrators have to lead that conversation. And And get it with instructional coaches and then get them with the staff, like trickle it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right, Michelle, like that time and we talk all that we hear we hear and we talk about all the time that we lack time, you know, and it is bar none. The one thing that when I have either met with teachers that I work with on a daily basis or done consulting, they always go back to, but where do we find the time? There's not enough time for that. There's not enough time for this. We have to make time for the right things. And that all comes from instructional leadership and what they are placing focus on and what they are valuing. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and if we take a step back and we like lay out our entire school year and we really analyze the patterns and consistencies, where does that show that we've been placing our time? And is that time well spent? Right. It's, I think it's the allocation of the time we already have. Yeah. We have the time. Yeah. We have all done that. Like, you know, this is my almost 25th year here and it, nothing has changed. The hours are the same. Yeah. The workload is the same, but it's the allocation of what we're doing with our time and right. that, and what the leaders are, are you know, allowing, I guess, um, and setting it up for if, if you, if it's all about the what, 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 and you're not switching it over to why yeah. you're always going to have this problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I often wonder, oh, go on, Casey. Nope, go for it, Jonna. I was just saying, like, I often wonder if sometimes it's just that first step is the hardest part, making the step into, you know, where to start. And I think that that's where, you know, you take the, you take, administrators need to be open to having consultants and coaches like yourselves to be able to outline what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, and learn how to guide those conversations. But figure if you are a principal who is, you know, not sure where to start, completely understandable why that first step is so difficult mm-hmm. for teachers and, and principals alike. Yeah, I think they share fear. Teachers fear that they're going to not do it right. Mm-hmm. And so in principals fear that they're not going to get it right. So they just kind of blindly follow that curriculum because they're told Mm -hmm. If you follow this, you'll be right. Yeah. It's like this vicious cycle, but it's all about confidence and that, that worry about fear if they get it wrong. It's about the outcome, like the scores. Yeah. Someone said, if instructional leaders don't lead the charge and advocate for the art and creativity, then a culture is created in which teachers Mm -hmm. are scared to make any changes to the curriculum. Hallelujah. I hear it all the time. Me too. Are we allowed to do that? Oh my gosh. Yes. (laughs) Uh Yes. Oh and my it's gosh. so sad. It's so sad. I'm like, yes, your gut is telling you to do this for your students. Do it. Do yeah. it. 
Oh, oh my yeah. God. Yeah. I think there are administrators though that say you're not. Yes. And it's because of, I, I feel like it's like teacher syndrome. As teachers, we want to save all of our kids. The moment they start to doggy paddle, you're like, let me throw out the life preserver instead of letting them productively struggle. Mm -hmm. Instructional leaders have done the same thing. The yeah. moment a teacher struggles, they're like, oh, they need, they need scripted curriculum. They don't know how to do it. And so it goes into this vicious cycle of now I've forgotten how to do it. Yeah. Because for so long now you've told me you have to follow this and it, it is, it's sad because we need the time to teach our teachers how to dive into curriculum. Right. They do need time to do it. But again, we got to take away a lot of other things on their plate and mm -hmm. it is how we are using that time. To, to make the time to do it. And we need productive PLCs. We need ones that are thriving to be able to do this work because we are stronger together than we are apart. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Melissa says, yes, Band-Aid and quick fixes. No more. No more. Yeah. 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 Pick it. <laughs> Someone else said no resources, one size fits all. And that's exactly yes. what we're running into more and more. Yeah. And that's no resource so is perfect. Yes. Oh my yeah. gosh. Like It's yeah. time to rip the Band-Aid off. That's yeah. another shirt. <laughs> yeah. That is another shirt. You know, I also think it's important to note that a lesson plan doesn't mean that you need to know what you're doing for every minute of your lesson. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the best lessons are the ones where you have the space to, you know, you're not sure the direction your lesson is going to take and that's okay. Um, but you know how you're going to respond mm -hmm. if it does take certain directions. And yeah. so when we talk about, to the point earlier about lesson planning, um, making things easier, that's your differentiation. That's yeah. your responsive teaching. Mm -hmm. That's you collecting data and then doing something with it all right. within the period. Right. Um, so so the, the, the thought of having a plan doesn't mean you've planned out your 45, 50 minute lessons. It means you know how students are either going to explore the content or how you're going to, to, to allow them to, you know, how you're going to teach that content. It means that if your students, you've, you've set up some sort of assessment in there for students to show that they, you know, where they lay in their, lie in their understanding. Yeah. Um, and it means that you have a, a plan for what you're going to do yeah. to respond to those needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a distinction there that we got to be real careful of because uh, some teachers, especially that they've been teaching a long time, they say, I don't, I don't need a lesson plan. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. To an extent, right. but you have to know what your end goal is and you have to be, have thought through different moves to get your kids there, depending on, you know, wh what they show you, they do. It doesn't mean you don't have a plan. It means, you know, lots of ways to get to the end result of that yeah. lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We have talked about a lot of things and I want to start to wrap it up, but what I want to ask you guys is um, we've talked a lot about, we, I feel like this conversation, we could just continue to go on and, and it's a conversation that's not going to stop, which is good for us because we always have problems to solve as consultants, <laughs> but but we want the problem to be solved, really. And I believe that that problem is partially solved when we have cohesive teams that can really dig into lesson design. So yep. tell me your thoughts as we start to wrap up. Why, why is lesson design important to building cohesive vision-driven teams? Like, why is it a part of that? It's the one goal. It's the one. Everyone has a vision of where to go. Instead of trying to wander into the woods, we know education is stressful. The job is stressful. And the more we are prepared, the easier it will be to make those decisions and get back on track once the chaos has calmed down. Right. And so it, it drives the team in the same direction. Mm hmm yeah. Someone said earlier, it goes back to vision casting. The lesson plan is the vision the teacher yeah. has for the students and the roadmap for how to get there. And 
when you share that vision with a team, then you can collectively come together and move forward better and faster with your student learning. And that's where the real conversation comes in, that backwards design conversation comes in, because you do have an end goal. Without it, my gosh, what are we even talking about? Like, what are we even doing when we come together? You know, I worked with an instructional coach this year. True story. Worked with an instructional coach and he was doing like all the work. He was doing everything and he was like running himself into the ground. And then he started dispersing the ownership, but at the same time, strengthening their competency of how to dive into standards and lesson design. The last marking period of the school year, he was like, Alyssa, I have time to do things. <laughs> because the team was all going in the same direction. So even though it takes time up front, yeah. it really does lessen the load, teachers. Mm -hmm. It lessens the load. Yep. Yeah. It makes me think, I think it's Hattie who says it. I'm pretty sure it's Hattie who says that it, it's not the variability of teaching skill from school to school. It's the variability of teaching skill from classroom to classroom within a school. Mm. And when you have the same vision and you know where you're going and you have those conversations about how and why, it raises the level of all the teaching within a building yeah. to make it more equitable for kids. That's what it comes down to for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, I think it comes to uh, shared ownership and responsibility and accountability. Yeah. Um, if everyone is held to the same standard and expectations in their lessons. It creates common language, shared drive to um, succeed in the classroom. And I'm always left thinking about all of the cross-curricular work that students will be exposed to because you've, you've got one less thing to worry about as a teacher because you know the the framework you're using yeah. and you know that your teammates and your colleagues are using it too. Um, it, sh it, it creates a, it, it grounds conversation mm -hmm. because yeah. Yeah. It, it takes out a lot of the variables in, in mm -hmm. a, in a lesson. Yeah. Yeah. For and my sure. lesson to principals on this one to piggyback Jonna is you, your, your family should come to your school and not care who you're, your child has as their teacher. Oh, it yes. is an equitable learning experience across the board. So my daughter, Everly, I should not care which teacher she has because I am comforted knowing they collaborate and have the same vision with yeah. one another. Yeah. I love that. I love that yeah. so much. Okay. So what I want you guys in the, if you're here live with us and you're able to put in the comments, I want you to jot down what you feel like was most useful for you here today in this conversation. And while you're putting those things in, we're going to do two things. Ladies, I want you to share like what your charge to our audience would be leaving this conversation or what you feel like you want them to take away. Remembering that the people that listen to this are instructional leaders. We're talking to instructional coaches. We're talking to specialists. We're talking to directors and principals. So what is your challenge or charge to them while people are putting things in the comments? I challenge leaders to, in thinking about their plans for next year, to um, create the space for teams to be able to get on the same page in terms of what a lesson plan looks like and sounds like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say I, I challenge leaders to challenge administrators to move away from allowing teachers to continue to planning just the what's right. and move into planning for discussing the how and the why, mostly the why, mm -hmm. not the what. Yep. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I would say at the start of the school year, heck, even now, facilitate a conversation with your teacher leaders and collaborate together on how to disseminate the message of the why and what that needs to look like. So not using the same lesson plan template you've used every year, right. having facilitating a conversation where y'all collaboratively create that together 
And like Michelle said, now train the teachers or host conversations around the why and really digging into it so everyone has ownership of that. And I know us four right here would be more than happy to speak to any instructional leader to be able to plan those facilitated conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that kind of leads me to my next point. This is a perfect concept or topic to go through a clarity cycle with. If you are thinking next year, like, oh, we really need to talk about lesson plans. I don't know how to roll that out and have this meaningful conversation, a clarity cycle is the way to go. So if you want to know more about Clarity Cycles, bit.ly slash Clarity Cycle, you'll learn more about it there. And I'm doing a mastermind this June. I have a June cohort. There are already 10 people. And that, so I had seven people were my spots and I have extended it to 10. I am giving away one spot. I'm going to announce the giveaway person, right? Or the person who won that spot. So if you'll just give me like a pretend Drum roll. And the winner is TL, and I'm going to say Briha, I think is the last name. So I'm going to email you, girl. You're going to get into the mastermind cohort. And guys, if you're not a winner of that, don't worry, you can still get in. I'm just kind of extending spots, but I don't want it to get too full because a small group is best. Okay. I've so enjoyed this conversation. Guys, remember, go to the show notes because there's. <laughs> Who's, who's calling? We're going to answer? My mom. My mom. Oh, hey, my, mom. my mom just texted me too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We need to let you know. call my mom. Be like, like where are you? Are you? <laughs> where are you? <laughs> okay, guys. Have a great evening. Have a great Memorial Day. We'll see you later. Thank you, ladies. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hey, guys, I want to give a huge shout out to you for tuning in to today's Change Catalyst conversation. I would love for you to do me two solid favors. Number one, if you have enjoyed this or any other Change Catalyst conversation, do me a favor and hit subscribe. I've got a lot of great content and guests coming up, and I don't want you to miss any of it. Number two, if you are thinking of a friend or colleague who could benefit from this show, share it with them. The only way to make change happen is through a multiplier effect. And you can be a multiplier by sharing this show. Until next time, I want you to go off and do the great things that change catalysts do.